Good morning to my brothers and sisters in Christ there in New York. I'm recording this this morning. It's uh, Wednesday morning and I'm sitting in my study here in Lincoln, England, which is about two hours north of London. Uh, a little bit of personal background uh, so you can put me in context. I've, I became a Christian when I was 20 years old. I came from a non-Christian background. Um, during the week, I was an apprentice engineer and over the weekends, I was um, a part-time hippie stroke rock musician and uh, was led to Christ by a friend of mine. And um, that became my journey. Um, I'm married to a wonderful lady, Mo. We celebrate 48 years of marriage this coming August. We have five grown-up children, um, and we have 11 grandchildren. And uh, I think that number will continue to grow. So it's a real joy to be with you this morning. Uh, special greetings to Pastor Camille and Anna. We've known each other for a long time, uh, studied together at college in England. And uh, we deeply appreciate your friendship, Camille and Anna. And um, praying that this little word that I have, when you asked me to speak, I almost immediately knew what I wanted to bring to you. And uh, I want to talk to you all this morning about God's perfect peace. For many of us, not only here in England, but with you in the States, the last couple of years have been extremely difficult. Um, jobs have been lost, lives have been lost, uh, to name just a few. Um, people have struggled with isolation, um, anxieties, and uncertainties. Others have discovered um, deeper values in life. And there have been times of reflection, times alone with God, times with a spouse, with friends, and a kind of an enforced, enforced, um, um, it just brought meaningful relationships to, to, to birth, I think, and to maturity. So it's been a mixed thing. Um, and I think one of the big areas that we've discovered here is, is that of spiritual, emotional, and mental health. People have struggled um, inwardly. And for many, there's been a thousand questions all boiling down for a cry for inner peace in the midst of utter turmoil. Can peace be found in what we've been going through and are going through. Many have looked for peace within themselves. Um, and there are a lot of gurus out there with their recommended methods. Um, others, on the other hand, have sought to find peaceful circumstances and peaceful environment. They've They've sought outwardly. And I, I sometimes think of the psalm where David said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. And uh, for some of us, that's just not been possible. I'm not bringing a new word to you this morning. I'm, I'm bringing an ancient word. There's nothing wrong with the ancient. In fact, I've, I've, as I've read the scriptures over and over, I, I find myself thinking much on the eternal things of God. So in the eternity of God, there's nothing new and there's nothing old. It's eternal. And I think it's a, a line of thought. It's worth investigating. But this is for us an old, ancient word. Jeremiah the prophet said these words. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is. 
and walk in it and find rest for your souls. So there is a biblical precedent for remembering and reminding ourselves of old truths. My thesis this morning is that God himself is the only authentic ground, the only center ground for authentic peace. We will only find true peace in God. I want therefore to refer to three great promises that he made. Three places where profound peace is to be found. And my first place are the scriptures, the Bible. About three quarters of the way through the prayer book, the psalm book of Israel, the book of Psalms, is Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the book. It's an acrostic psalm, which means that every little paragraph starts with one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and uh, it's there to, to help the memory especially if you are Jewish. And it's all about the word of God. Matthew Henry wrote of them that they are a chest of gold rings, a chest of gold rings, not a chain of gold links. In other words, each verse stands on its own. And I want to look at just one of them. It's found in verse 165 of Psalm 119. And it's this. Great peace have they who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Great peace have they who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. That's an incredible verse with an incredible promise. And so the first thing to notice is the place where it's found. It's to be found in the law of God. Great peace of those are the, for those who love your law. And so the law of God. Now, what was the law of God? Well, to the psalmist, it was the first five books of Moses. That was the law, the Torah. And a great Bible teacher called Donald Miller once put the first five books in, in this way, in this order. He, he felt the five books described the birthing and the maturing of the, of the nation of Israel. And he put the five books like this. He said, Genesis is the prenatal word of God. Everything in Genesis is embryonic. You have the beginnings of mankind. You have the beginnings of sin. You have the beginnings of the promises of God. You have the beginnings of everything. And I think that's why the book of Genesis is so challenged these days, because you have the beginnings in that book. It's embryonic of everything. And then you get to Exodus, which... Miller said, this is infancy and birth. Um, if you like, these are the birth pangs of the nation in Egypt. You get the breaking through of the waters at the Red Sea and the infant nation learning their first words at Mount Sinai. It's a lovely picture. And so we have this infant in Exodus. And then we get to Leviticus, which he says, well, this is like childhood. This is where the growing nation learns the ABC of walking with God in Leviticus. This is how you do life with me. And then we get to adolescence. We get to numbers, which he calls adolescence. Now, I've raised five children. 
and I've seen the transition between childhood into adolescence. And adolescence can be a little bit of a stormy time, what with hormones and all those kind of things going on. And so numbers is adolescence, where we struggle through the awkwardness of the wilderness and kick against authority, trying to find our own feet, our own way. That's numbers. And then you get to Deuteronomy, which is adulthood, and the nation is now grown up in God and ready to step into the promises and the inheritance that God has for them. So it's a great way of looking at the law. And so the man or the woman who studied the law of God found great peace because he saw what God was doing and what God was up to and what God's purposes were. Eugene Peterson, one of my favorite theologians, taught that everything that God wanted to say to us was said in Torah, the first five books of Moses. Torah is the basic Bible. Everything that follows in scripture is derivative from the first five books of the Bible. These uh, five books are the words of God that hit the target of the human condition. The Hebrew word is from the, the verb yoro, which means to throw something like a javelin in order to hit a mark. And so Eugene Peterson taught that in living speech, words are like javelins hurled from one mind to another. And God's words have this aimed, intentional, personal nature. When we are spoken to in this way through God's words, they pierce and penetrate us and we're not the same. These words get inside of us and work their meaning into us. And when we allow the word of God to do that, stuff happens inside. In Psalm 94, verse 19, we read, when the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. That can be read quite literally. When my anxious and troubling thoughts are numerous, your warm, compassionate words and embrace, soothe and caress my soul. There's something therapeutic about the word of God. And those that get into it seriously find incredible peace. The second thing to notice is that is the phrase great peace. It can be translated abundant peace. So this is not a trickle. This is not a trickle. Neither is it a sticking plaster. We're going to see that this, this peace of God is immense, powerful, transforming, restorative, all those lovely things. The third thing is the promise. Nothing, nothing will make them stumble. Let me say straight away, this is not a promise that nothing bad will ever happen to us. It is a promise that whatever happens to us, our inner equilibrium will be kept secure. We will be at peace in the middle of the storms of life. Which brings me to my next point. Focusing on God. So we get peace from the word of God. We get peace by focusing on God. Now, hear the prophet Isaiah. He said, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. 
trust in the Lord forever, for he is an everlasting rock. Now, there are three things about this verse, too. Number one, it's God who does the keeping. You will keep him in perfect peace. I, I love the verse found in Psalm 37, 23, 24, where it says, the steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, not if, when he falls, he shall not be cast headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. As I've said, I've raised five kids. I've also been very involved with grandchildren. And when they're trying to walk for the first time, um, you hold their hand. They don't hold yours because if they do trip, their little grip is not strong enough. And so they just let go and take a tumble. And so a wise parent, if he's teaching a child to walk, will hold the hand of the child. So if he does make a little trip or a little stumble, he doesn't fall, he just goes for a little swing. And the parent puts him back down again. And I want to tell you, friends, that's how it is with you, each one of you. Whenever you trip, God is holding your hand because your grip will never be strong enough. Our grip is just simply not strong enough. Your grip on God is not strong enough. It's his grip on you. It is in the times when storms of trial rage around us that our hearts and our minds will be kept, kept, kept by God. The Hebrew word guarded means, the Hebrew word means guarded, sorry, the Hebrew word means guarded. Our hearts shall be kept. It's as if there's a strong garrison, fortress inside of us, keeping us secure. It's like God said, I will guard your heart and your mind. And we might come on to that verse a little later. I think you know where it might be. The second thing to notice is, is that the phrase perfect peace. Here is simply the repeating of the one Hebrew word shalom or shalom. It's repeated for emphasis, highlighting the immense strength and scope of this peace of God. It's far more than peaceful circumstances. It reaches to the heart. It reaches to the mind. And it can reach to the physical body. Sometimes the reasons why some of us are having aches and pains is because of stress, not in the muscles, but in here and in here. And God can touch even that. The third thing to notice is the staying of the mind. The New Living Translation puts it like this. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And so the Bible has a lot to say about the setting of the mind. The mind, if you like, directs us, our emotions feel, and our will makes choices. And it kind of works that way around. We think, we feel, we make a choice. Scripture teaches us to take our, our thoughts captive before they get into our feelings. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So take captive your thoughts before they take you captive. Get in there quick. And so in the Bible, we're challenged to have our thinking renewed. 
Paul wrote to the church in Rome, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By that, so that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. He expands this in his letter to the Ephesians by saying, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's an interesting phrase, the spirit of the mind. And I've thought about that and I've come to the conclusion it means something like this. Let the Holy Spirit give you fuel for thought. Let the Holy Spirit give you fuel for thought. And so we are encouraged to think about certain things and the Holy Spirit wants to do that with us. Paul wrote to the Philippians, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Focus. That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is fixed, stayed on you. And I think the third thing I want to say is have honest conversation with God. I say honest conversation with God. Sometimes people ask us, how are you doing? And we say, yeah, we're good. Because we know they haven't got the time to listen to what we're really going through. So we kind of brush it off. We're good. We're OK. We're doing fine. Sometimes we do that with God. Hey, God, I'm here this morning before you in your word in church and I'm doing OK. And I think Father wants to look at you and say, come on, what's going on? Really? I, I learned with my kids and my kids would try to bluff me off. Well, yeah, we're doing good. And I could see in their face and in their whole demeanor that something was up. And so I would say, come on, what's going on? What's going on deep inside you? Come and talk to me. Let's hear it. And then we can work it out. Paul wrote to the Philippians, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So there are three things about this. The first thing is a command. For that's what it is. When you look into the Greek text, it's a, it's a command. Do not be anxious. That sounds quite soft, doesn't it? Do not be anxious. The Greek scholar Kenneth Vess wrote this. The Greek construction indicates that we have here a prohibition. A prohibition which forbids the continuance of an action already habitually going on. So what's going on here? The Philippian Christians were habitually worrying about everything. And Paul says, stop it. Just stop it. My, as I said earlier on, I, I, I became a Christian when I was 20 years old, uh, non-Christian family. And after a few months, my, my dad called me over and said, um, this Christianity thing has got quite a hold on you, hasn't it? So I said, well, how can you tell that? He said, give me your hand. And I gave him my hand. I said, well, how can you tell? He said, well, you've stopped biting your nails. I thought, I'd never noticed but something was put in my nervous system, my thinking, my heart at rest. And I'd, without even thinking, 
stop biting my nails. And Paul says, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop being anxious. The word nothing is literally not even one thing. Can I say that anxiety is a killer to mature spirituality? It erodes trust. It erodes trust in the sovereign God and Father. So don't let it eat you up. Paul is saying, but stop this because it's, it's eroding your walk and your trust in your heavenly Father who actually has a lot of time for you and takes care of you. So stop it. So you think, well, that's all very well and good. Um, because I have a lot of anxious stuff at the moment. And um, to be honest, there are some right anxieties that, you know, they say your kids may leave your home, but they never leave your heart. So I'm I'm watching my grown up kids with their wives and their families, and I still have a little flutter of anxiety for them. Uh, Paul talked about his anxiety for the churches. So there's a right anxiety, but there's a lot of wrong ones. Um, worrying about things that probably will never happen. Don't let it eat you up. So what do I do with these anxieties? Well, God gives you an antidote. Gather them all up one by one and take them <coughs> one by one into the presence and the hearing of God. Take them all into his presence. The New Living Translation puts it like this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, Pray about everything. Bring every little and large anxiety before him. And what you're doing there is very simply, you're exercising faith. Instead of turning in on yourself or reaching out to others, you are turning to God himself. That, my friends, is faith. Let me read to you the words of Jesus. <clears throat> Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you should drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what should we eat? What should we drink? What should we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and listen, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Many years ago, um, I was a missionary in southern France on a church planting team um, back in the early 70s. And at the end of that time, um, I was having pressure for my family to come home, to get a job. I was engaged to be married to Mo. Um, 
And my mother's words to me was, it's time to get out of this cloud cuckoo land and come home and get your feet on the ground and get a real job and start saving money towards your marriage. And all that was coming in one ear. And then another dear friend of mine who also was a, a kind of a, an evangelist in, in England said to me, he said, um, I know you're coming to the end of your time on the mission field with this organization. Um, and I don't know what you're thinking, but I just felt I wanted to tell you, God has called you. And so to say true to your calling. So that came in that ear. I had a, an opportunity to go to Geneva for a week. So I spent most of that week praying, seeking God. I've got this voice. I've got this voice. What do I do? And that was my big question. And then one afternoon I was sitting in the Reformers Park in Geneva. It's a great place to sit, surrounded by history, spiritual Christian history. And I was reading this particular text in, in, in Matthew. And as I read it, I got to the bottom. I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Alan, do you believe what you're reading? And I paused and uh, thought to myself, my future depends on my answer to that question. And I said, yes, Lord, I do believe in what I've been reading. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Alan, you're called. You will not go back to secular work. It settled my heart immediately. And I went home, faced a little bit of flat from the family. But I want to say to you that God has provided for me every step of the way. I've never missed a payment on my home. I've never had holes in my shoes. I've always had food on the table. We've gone through hard times, lean times, good times, wonderful times. But God has never failed his promise to look after me and my family. And I give him all the glory for that. The third thing is to notice God's response. So I have all these anxieties. What do I do? I take them into the presence of God, trusting him. So those are the two things that are my responsibility. Stop worrying, take them into God's presence. The third is God's response. Paul wrote, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, garrison, shelter your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, there are three more thoughts that come out of this. Number one, this peace surpasses all understanding. The New Living Translation puts it like this. This peace exceeds anything we can understand. Many have testified about finding themselves in terrible times, but at the same time finding themselves kept in a peace that is beyond their understanding. And at sometimes others around have noticed it. They make comments like, you know, I, I know the pressure you're under. I know the stress that you're in. But you're not cracking up. There's something about it. I don't understand it, but you seem to be restful in the middle of turmoil. Now, what's going on? And you can only scratch your head and say, well, I don't know myself, but I feel incredibly kept by the peace of God. It stops me from cracking up. Secondly, this peace guides your heart and mind. Here we have the New Testament version of that word, Hebrew word, keep. Kenneth Vest wrote, the word shall keep is a military word. It shall mount God. God's peace will mount God over your mind and heart. His peace, like a soldier, like a sentinel, mounts God and patrols before your mind and your heart's door, keeping worry out. This is the divine activity of God. I tell you, it's amazing. It's supernatural. You can't explain it. I should be cracking up. I should be falling apart. But somehow I'm being held 
by this enormous, incredible peace in my heart and in my mind. And thirdly, this peace is found in the sphere of Jesus Christ. He, he is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who came from heaven to make peace between us and God. The Bible tells us that through Christ, we have peace with God. It's only found in him. The Bible tells us that he is the only one who can make peace between bitter enemies. It's found only in him. The Bible tells us that it is only in him that we can know true peace within and with ourselves. So, in conclusion, we need to stop floundering about, looking for various options. The answers are not found within us or around us. God alone has the answer. Now, I don't know if this will carry over into your culture, into your language. If there's one thing I've learned in this Christian life of walking with him now for over 55, 54 years, I know where God lives. He lives at wit's end corner. It's that place where I really don't know what to do. That's where he lives. So we need to start having honest conversations with God. God, today I feel terrible. See, if you read the Psalms, they're full of it. But they're, they're expressing faith. They're not talking to someone on the phone. They're not going into their laptops and looking for answers from spiritual gurus. They're talking to God. I feel terrible. That's an act of faith. And we need to allow him entrance. You see, the Lord wants to take up residence in you. He brings with him forgiveness and mercy. In other words, he understands you and he wants to forgive you. He brings with him the cleansing and transforming power of his spirit to make everything new and everything different he becomes our rock he becomes our fortress he becomes our strong refuge so the perfect peace of god open your bibles get into them they will fill you with the peace and you'll see the stories of your god who is absolutely sovereign over everything knows everything and does incredible miraculous things get into your bibles learn his mind learn his heart learn his thoughts it will just bring unbelievable peace get into the bible Focus your mind on him. Keep fixed on him. I don't know what's going on, but God, my, I'm fixing my mind and my heart on you, and you will keep me in perfect peace. And then anxieties, worries, stop it. Stop it. And take every one of them into the presence of God and watch what will happen. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for my brothers and sisters sitting in this church this morning. And I pray that they will begin to experience at a deeper level this astonishing peace of God. I pray for those who are sitting here this morning that have never, ever opened up their hearts to you. I pray today will be a day when they see that you are enormously wonderful that you come with forgiveness, and I pray that their hearts may be open to see how wonderful you are. 
And I pray for the church there in New York. I pray that they will find you as a strong refuge, as a strong tower. And I pray even further that people coming into the building may sense the kingdom of God among them, that this particular building will become a safe place for those coming in troubled, anxious, and looking for answers. God bless this church. Bless Camille and Anna as they seek to lead them. And may your hand be upon them. May God's favor and God's peace be in you and among you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. Bless your heart.